Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining the second webinar of this series. I'm Laura Allegue, I'm the course lead for the MITx MicroMaster in Supply Chain Management. And today we're fortunate to have here Dr. Eva Ponce with us. She's the director of the MIT Omnichannel Distribution Strategies and the executive director of our program. We are very happy to have you joining us today, Eva. Thank you for having me, Laura. Awesome. So for the next 20 minutes, and just for you to have the agenda for the session, Dr. Ponzi will be sharing her insights on the changing landscape of omnichannel fulfillment. She will also give us an overview of the major challenges that retailers face when implementing omnichannel distribution strategies. I must say that uh, we've just started and we've mentioned the word omnichannel several times. So based on that, I would love to have you explain us a bit more on what we mean with omnichannel distribution and omnichannel fulfillment, um, just to set the floor for the upcoming questions. Excellent, Laura. So to explain what om omnichannel means, uh, let's start having a look to the omnichannel customer experience. Let's see what this means from the customer perspective. So if we have a look to um, this omnichannel customer experience, one of the first thing or options that most of the customers have when they are planning to buy, let's say any new pair of shoes or any product is of course to go to the store and buy in the store. This is the traditional in-person experience. And I wanted to highlight here that still in the US retail sales space, 85% of the shopping still occurs or happen in a store. So it's important just to keep that in mind. Second thing is we also have the option as a customer and many retailers are offering this option to us now to buy online and pick up in the store. Um, almost about 70% of all shopping events start now online, searching, comparing, looking, online. So this is another option that also retailers are offer, offering to their customers. And third, this is kind of a new business model, but many companies are also moving into that. So you can go to the store and buy online. So you go to the store just to try to test the product. And these are called showrooms or guide shops. Um, there are companies like Bonobos that uh, they born with this new business model. There are companies like Nordstrom that they are also trying to offer or Warby Parker, many examples of companies that are offering this space that you can go just to try and test the product. However, the stock they have in, this, in, the, in the store is just for that purpose. You cannot buy the product there. You need to buy online and receive at home. And there are also traditional uh, brick and mortars like Adidas that they are offering you the opportunity to go to the store and offer whichever items they have in stock in that store. But in addition to that, they are using the technology is called endless sale in order to offer to you also items that they have in their fulfillment center and they can send uh, to your home. So as we can see from the customer perspective, there are multiple options, multiple channels that you can use in order to buy your product, in order to pick up your product. And in addition to that, you can also use multiple devices. You can use mobile devices, you can use your, your desktop or lap laptop in order to uh, buy these products. Um, one more thing I want to add in terms of the trends is that 70% of customers still identify faster home delivery as their main expectation for retail stores. So this is also bringing some challenges to the supply chain. Now, what I want to do here is let's think about what does omnichannel means for the supply chain. So if we have a look to the buying process, from discovery, the need of buying something, search, buy, delivery, and also think about returns, what happened now is that customer expectation is almost to search, buy, return from anywhere. And from the supply chain perspective, this brings a mess. It, it's, it's really a mess to manage these different channel, uh, channels that uh, these retailers 
omnichannel retailers are offering to their customers because there are many different options in every single stage of the buying process. So this connects very well with the omnichannel definition. When we are talking about omnichannel retail, we are talking about the combination of digital and physical channels. The we need to have at least these two components. And then of course, all of the hybrid modes that we just uh, mentioned. Also omnichannel retailers are trying to provide a customer seamless experience. And in order to provide this seamless experience to their customers, they need to integrate on the back end of their supply chain, the different channels. So channels integration is one of the big things that companies from the supply chain perspective need to, to, to have in order to provide this seamless customer ex experience. And this has many implications from the, let's say, inventory perspective. Uh, companies need to know where they have their inventory and have inventory visibility in order to be able to provide this customer experience. So this has many different implications from many different angles. I hope, L Laura, I have answered at least your question about what is omnichannel and what does this mean? It's been super clear and it's also, I think, been super interesting to all our audience to see how you have this visual uh, image on how Omnichannel behaves. So it's super interesting. Thank you. Um, we are ready, I think, to go straight forward to our main topic for today. And just to begin with this, uh, I was thinking on e-commerce. E-commerce was already showing a growing trend back at the end of 2019. Um, but the surge in e-commerce co caused by the pandemic itself went uh, beyond what we expected originally for the short term, I would say. So as you've mentioned before, former in-store traditional retailers were then moving to hybrid strategies, incorporating e-commerce and getting into this road to omnichannel. However, there's also your comment on how um, in some industries and in some countries like retail in the United States, most of the purchases still happen in physical stores. So uh, considering that, I wanted to ask you, how are the former online pure player facing this omnichannel challenges to improve customers' experience and to grow or even to at least keep their market share? This is a very interesting question, Laura. And it's really interesting to see how um, pure players like Amazon, Amazon started in 1995 selling 100% online, a 100% online marketplace, 1995, selling books. Now Amazon is selling almost every kind of different products for sure. Um, in 2017, they started the, their journey to move into being also an omnichannel retailer. They bought a uh, Whole Food in 2017. Um, this uh, represent about 400 uh, supermarket, the physical brick and mortar retailers. Um, when they did that, was more to compete in the grocery industry, was also uh, to be able to uh, fulfill online orders from these physical brick and mortar retail stores, um, being able to provide same day delivery, two hours deliveries to the prime members in just two hours. So the, stra the strategy was to be present in the brick and mortar retailer space, but also to be able to use these stores in order to fulfill online orders. Recently, in last September uh, 2021, Amazon announced that they are planning to roll out about 80 physical stores. These are a physical a clothing store. They are also a pushing now their new brand, their own brand of clothes. And they are also trying to, to capture this uh, in-person shopping and those customers that, as you mentioned, still they are going in a store in order to buy their products. So let's say in um, analyzing the reasons behind this strategy of moving into the brick and mortar space for pure, pure players like Amazon, I would say that reaching new customers is one of the reasons. And you also mentioned that the second one one is also to provide to their customer this omnichannel experience. And we are observing this coming from the digital world, like Amazon, but also coming from the traditional brick and mortar space, like Walmart and Target and Tesco and many other traditional brick and mortar space that are moving into the, this digital world. 
Another reason um, is important to highlight that is also to test out technology. Um, Scan and Go is one of those examples. Amazon started with Amazon Go some years ago. They pil pilot this a uh, convenient store in Seattle um, just to test also this Scan and Go technology, just to provide a different in-person customer experience with, without the need of going through the cashiers, just to avoid the cashier line and trying to avoid this or provide this um, cashier free experience to their in-person customer. Virtual dressing is something, is a technology based of, on augmented reality. What they are trying to do is combine um, digital information with actual information. So while the customer is in the store testing uh, and trying out a uh, new clothes, the app is offering them additional uh, items that they can try and they can combine and um, trying to somehow to increase their uh, sales in that way. But it's also a way for them with these physical stores to test out this kind of new technology that they are investing and developing. Uh, to raise the brand awareness is another reason. Try out uh, fits before trying the clothes, before purchasing them. And this is something that also connect with the showrooms or guide shops that we are also observing a trend in the industry with Nordstrom, Target, Bonobos, and other companies. And also, uh, I want to bring here the returns because uh, especially in the apparel industry, especially in the fashion industry, returns represent 35 to 40 percent so it's truly a, a high number and and the the returns percentage is growing with the growth of e-commerce so it's also a way to reduce these uh, clothing returns so i i would say that uh, this has these are um the, the main reasons probably for pure players to move into that space and what is really interesting to me is to observe this um movement from digital world to the brick and mortar space from pure players. And at the same time, observing how the traditional brick and mortars already started, and most of them started this journey before the pandemic in order to be able to compete in the online world. And Walmart is a good example of that. However, the pandemic has accelerated this need for a, a traditional brick and mortar in order to be present in the digital world and in order to be able to sell online also. Thank you, Eva. This is super interesting news that you share. And I, I also love the fact that we are showing here what was it like before the pandemic and what is it after the pandemic or almost there. And it's very interesting to see that the trend is the same. It's just um, going much faster and it's changing probably the reasons why things are going on. So thank you for bringing all that to the audience. I also know that you have been running a survey for research purposes in this field and already have some preliminary insights that you can share with us. So I would love to have our uh, supporting team, thank you Chan for that, um, to share the survey in the chat in case those in retail want to participate after closing the event. So I'm really curious to know, Dr. Eva, what's the most surprising fact that you have served regarding the change in landscape of omnichannel fulfillment and if there was any unexpected result? Yeah, good question, Laura. Um, yeah, this is, a, as you mentioned, preliminary result. This is a survey we ran last fall. Um, we analyzed the results by the end of December 2021. So we were asking companies about, hey, how are the growth of e-commerce changing your strategies and how is this impacting your supply chains? We receive about 40% of our sample are retailers. Retailers, um, mm, uh, Important part of those are uh, retailers working on the food and grocery industry. About 40% of uh, the, the respondents are companies with more than 5,000 employees. And one thing that is really interesting is about 80% of them are implementing or planning to implement in the short term omnichannel distribution strategies. So we asked them about which are the top areas that are, have been more impacted by the growth of e-commerce. So what did not surprise me is that uh, distribution and logistics 
and order fulfillment are in between these top areas that has been more impacted. And this makes total sense. Of course, the distribution channels, they need to decide how many channels they are going to offer, how they are going to distribute or fulfill those orders in order to meet their customer expectation. Network design was also on the top list. Um, the reason is that as we mentioned before, when we are talking about omnichannel, we need to have this integration between the online and the offline channel. So we need to um, design our network in a way that we can provide this integration in between the different channels. So I was not surprised to see that almost 60% of the responses uh, highlight network design as one of the top areas. And I, I believe that the reason is this need of integrating the different channels. Of course, inventory management and demand forecasting was also very highly rate in, in the responses and makes totally sense. And this connect with the seamless customer experience. We need to have this inventory visibility and know exactly where our inventory is in order to provide uh, different options to our customer. What I was a little bit surprised is that returns was a knowledge by 35% of the respondents. However, it was expected probably a higher uh, percentage of uh, responses in that area. Um, I'm saying that because uh, the, the, the returns in the e-commerce or digital channel represent on average 20-25% versus the 7.5%, 10% that represents in the brick and mortar uh, uh, channel, the offline channel. So it's growing. Uh, in the apparel industry is about 35-40%. So it's an area that I believe is going to or I uh, think that companies are going to pay more and more attention to that area as uh, the growth of e-commerce is also um, a, a trend that is uh, currently happening. Another thing that surprised me is that we also asked the companies about which distribution channels are you offering. Um, what we have here is that um, about 40% uh, of them said home delivery, but uh, about 60% mentioned click and collect. So click and collect is one of the options that is uh, growing. And more specifically, I would say curbside pickup, especially in the grocery industry. So is, I was surprised to see how click and collect is gaining market share in this, in this area. Thank you, Eva. So I would like to connect all this you have just shared with our second poll. So I'm launching it right now. Um, hope everyone can participate. We love to have your perspective on our topics. And as you highlighted before, Omnichannel is not just about integrating online and offline channels, but it refers to creating the seamless experience. So my question for the audience today is what are the challenges that they think that companies are experiencing when offering a customer this seamless experience. So some of the options include um, the integration of the systems, as you just mentioned, or deciding where to keep the inventory or where to fulfill from, and also managing inventory redundancy that um, probably we can talk about more at the end of the event on that, uh, if any questions from the audience. Um, but uh, while you all respond, I would like to go back to Dr. Ponce. So here at MIT CTL, you know that we love to think on solutions every time we analyze uh, challenges. So based on that, and while we start seeing the results, I would like to ask you, how do companies deal with the challenges that omnichannel strategies bring to their daily operations? Good question, Laura. Um, many different ways. I would say there are certain things that uh, are helping companies in order to face these challenges. I'm going to connect this with some of the key pain points we have identified in this study. And one of the first uh, pain points companies is bringing is to position the right item in the right location, where to locate the items, how to fulfill the orders, how to ship the orders. So this is, and, and this definitely connect with what you just said, with the mess of integrating the different channels and how to manage these different channels in every single stage of the buying process. So um, companies are doing different things. We have examples of those companies that are 
uh, heavily investing in automation. Ocado in UK is one example. They have fully automated fulfillment centers. They are able to prepare in two to three minutes a 45 to 50 items online order. This is truly fast. They are doing it in an efficient way in order to be able to also have fast deliveries. However, we need to say here that they are just focused on the online channel. This is just the online channel and they are trying to do a very good job gaining efficiencies about how to prepare this based on automation. Uh, another trend I'm also observing is the use of dark stores. This is a trend that also started in the UK some years ago. Tesco was one of the first companies and Ocado that they were playing with this new format to fulfill online orders. I'm observing also this trend growing here in the United States, especially in the grocery industry. However, other industries like apparel industry are also playing and piloting this kind of a way to fulfill all online orders. Dark stores are basically stores that instead of being designed for customers, our design, the layout is optimized for pickers. So we don't have customers in these dark stores. What we have is pickers just preparing uh, online orders. So this is a model I'm also observing. Um, typically they are close to the uh, final customers. So they are also able to provide fast deliveries. Micro fulfillment centers. This is another trend that is also growing. These are uh, small spaces typically co-located in the, in the store or very close to the store location, fully automated. Um, another way to prepare in an efficient way online orders and also in a fast way, just to meet these um, fast deliveries that customers are asking. So micro fulfillment center is another trend. And then the last mile delivery, the last mile delivery of how to ship these online orders is definitely a challenge because the last mile delivery represents an important cost of the total logistic cost when we are talking about e-commerce. So companies are here also uh, looking for flexibility and all of the disruption in the supply chain related to the lack of drivers, lack of vans, is also affecting the last mile delivery. It's also affecting uh, the e-commerce uh, space. So companies are also looking looking for solutions here. Autonomous uh, vehicles is definitely some uh, uh, innovation and some of the technologies that companies are exploring, especially for the mid, uh, for the mid mile, uh, more than last mile deliveries, but definitely also something that we need in order to be able to, to complete the, the entire process. So I would say this is one of, of, the, of the areas just to design and think and rethink their fulfillment strategy and how they are going to fulfill including automation or including new formats and ways to uh, uh, meet that um, goal. The second thing um, that was identified is companies are struggling with keeping up with relevant technological um, advances. So in that sense, uh, some companies are very actively in, in implementing new initiatives. Endless Sale is one of the examples. We have here examples like Adidas that they are offering to you through their uh, stores, also the items that they have in the fulfillment center, just to also uh, allow you to buy in the store online and receive at home. Real-time inventory visibility is another thing that some companies are investing now. We have here the example of Zara. They are able to identify every single item using RFID technology. And this is uh, helping them to know where the, their inventory is. They know exactly in the store where the inventory is. They also know where is in any uh, um, stage of the supply chain, a store, distribution center, centers, intermediate depot, et cetera. Um, mobile point of sales is another trend that especially for brick and mortars in order to provide a better in-person experience. And I would say also um, automation new generation e-fulfillment center. This is one of the trends I'm observing 
more in those companies that really are trying to compete in this space and trying to face some of the challenges that we just mentioned. Best Buy is one of the examples. Recently, they modernized their supply chain in order to be able to uh, prepare their online orders in a more efficient way and a faster way. Uh, the second picture is an example, is the example of the uh, new generation e fulfillment center that Bonobos, this uh, showroom or guide shops, is using. This is uh, um, the, the location they have to fulfill all of the, the worldwide uh, online orders. They have their 2.5 million items. And they are using 70 robots. These are collaborative robots. These are robots that are helping pickers to prepare the online orders. So I'm seeing more and more in, um, companies investing in automation or these collaborative robots that uh, still combines manual labor with uh, some uh, assistant in order to automatic assistant in order to prepare the online orders and make that in a more efficient and fast way. Thank you, Eva. So um, you already started us answering questions from our audience while you were presenting because we had questions on the difference between dark store and micro fulfillment center. And we also uh, have in the poll that most people answer that integrating online and omni-channel and offline channels um, is the main challenge they have identified. So the technology you shared uh, is super helpful for them to connect with uh, their observations. So thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah. we are running short of time. So before jumping to the Q and A's with the audience, I'd like to have one last question, if you permit. So as it happens with many supply chain topics and considering the additional complexity driven by recent global disruptions, I can imagine you'll tell us there's no one size fits all answer for these questions, but I will give it a try anyway. I want to know, and for our audience, what would be your best advice to those working on implementing omnichannel distribution and fulfillment within their company for the first time? Where should they start? Okay, definitely this is a complex, a, a question that requires a complex answer. I would say the first thing is to redefine their strategy, to think about which are the channels they are planning to offer and which is their fulfillment strategy. I would say this is kind of the very first thing to think about. The second thing is IT system. Companies need fast, an integrated IT system in order to being able to provide this seamless customer experience. The third thing, and probably this is more for brick and mortars, traditional brick and mortars, is also to rethink and redesign their physical space. How they are planning to offer or, or, or offer a new in-person experience to their customers. And recently, a couple of days ago, Walmart announced uh, their new concept for their in-person experience, the new concept of their store. So companies are actively rethinking how to use the physical space in order to provide a better in-person experience for their customer. And at the same time, they also need to think how they are going to use that space to prepare or fulfill or ship the online orders from that store, because those stores are close to their final customers. So this allowed them also for fast deliveries, um, um, also reduce some cost here. So this is the three, the three things. And the last but not least, I also want to bring once more the importance of uh, think about how to manage their commercial returns, because this is something that with the growth of e-commerce is also growing a lot. Um, I think companies should also pay attention to that area. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for your recommendation. I'm sure the audience truly appreciates that advice. So I want to run the last poll and then we will keep it open while we answer a couple of questions from the audience. So we want to know what was the most interesting part of today's session for you all. So uh, we would love to have your answers on that. And then um, on the questions from the audience, you mentioned click and collect detached. So some uh, of our members of the audience would like to know the details on uh, what does it mean? 
Yes, these are the lockers. So some companies are offering you the, the option to pick up your online order uh, using these detached uh, devices or detached space. Um, these lockers sometimes are companies that they have inside the store, sometimes is outside the store. In Europe, they are also using these kind of lockers in condominiums or they are using in the metro stations. So these are another pickup point that uh, companies are offering uh, to the customers in order to uh, pick up their online orders. And some companies also are using this detached um, uh, space for returns as an option to drop off the returns and also for some more convenience to their customers uh, for um, return their uh, items or their products. Thank you, Eva. So there is a member of the audience that is asking um, about the specific impact of the omnichannel changes affecting the 3PL companies. Do you have any comment on 3PL in, uh, impacted by e-commerce growth and omnichannel? Yeah, of course, definitely. So yeah, the growth of e-commerce is definitely impacting 3, 3PL companies. Um, there are companies like Amazon, they heavily invest in their own fleet. Uh, and they already celebrate the 1 billion package uh, using their own fleet. But this is not the case for most of the companies. Most of the companies are using third-party logistic providers for uh, their, their online orders delivery. So this is a growing area also for third-party logistic providers. And at the end of the day, what this is bringing, this uh, last mile delivery piece is also uh, more fragmented now because we need to reach out to the final uh, customer destination. So we are fragmenting this uh, last leg or last part of the total uh, um, delivery network. So it's challenging because also connect with the, the, the cost that last mile delivery represents. So shippers are also uh, dealing with the challenge of these last mile deliveries and, and the cost associated to that. But definitely a growing area, most of the companies are having kind of agreements, a partnership with third party logistic providers in order to uh, being able to deliver these online orders. And connecting to that, I also want to add that another trend is delivery as a service. Um, some companies also, in order to add flexibility, are having uh, agreements with crowdsourcing solutions like Instacart or DoorDash, or some companies like Walmart are mm, building their own delivery as a service solution. And this is also a trend that is bringing some flexibility for just yes, this last mile delivery part of the process. Awesome. Thank you, Eva. And I would like to make just one more uh, quick one. Um, one of the members of our audience is asking if you think that omnichannel initiatives help in case of disruption that could be caused by extreme weather, um, hurricanes or flooding, how does having an omnichannel supply chain or fulfillment mode or strategy overall uh, would help a company to be uh, more resilient, for example, or to face disruption in case it happens? This is a very good question. I would say that in general, Omnichannel is adding complexity to the network. It's adding complexity because companies need to manage the multiple channels and do it in an integrated way. Uh, so add complexity is always at a more source of issues and challenges and problems. But having said that, um, they also need to have a inventory ready in, in many different locations. So some of them, what they have is uh, redundancy in the inventory. This redundancy at uh, this uh, way to have uh, different nodes able to deliver the orders might help with disruption because uh, somehow add uh, more uh, options to your network. So in that way is in the only way I can see that these omni-channel strategies can help with disruptions because you also are able to deliver through multiple channels. So you can also compensate uh, one issue in one channel with another one. But in any case, we need to be aware that uh, implement this kind of strategies bring complexity. However, 
you need to compete and companies definitely, uh, I believe that they need to be present in that world. And also um, disconnect with integration of the online and offline channels. What I'm observing is that companies that are able to use and integrate facilities are also uh, able to reduce the total uh, uh, logistic costs associated to the network and also are able to reduce the lead time associated to those orders. So I truly believe that this integration of the network is helping in all sense and also probably with disruptions. However, this depends on the kind of disruption <laughs> we are talking about. Of course, thank you Eva for that uh, answer. So I'm sharing the results of the last poll. Thank you everyone for answering. So most people uh, said that it was super interesting to expand their knowledge on omni-channel and also to understand the impact of e-commerce growth. So thank you Eva for uh, sharing that with us. I don't know if you want to add anything on that, otherwise we are going to wrap it up. This is an exciting topic. Um, I truly encourage supply chain professionals to learn more about this topic and to be ready to help uh, the industry in this excited area. Thank you so much, Laura, for having me today. Thank you, Eva, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today. Remember, this is just the second webinar of a series of three that we will have uh, at the MicroMaster in SEM these days. So we're looking forward to seeing you all on the next webinar by the end of February. Uh, and stay tuned to our LinkedIn post, course dashboard, and emails to register. Thank you everyone for joining us today.